All right, so uh, turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 1. The text that I will be reading from here will be on the screen shortly, uh, so you can follow along up there if you would like. Uh, One one thing to note, too, is you're going to be inundated with Scripture references this morning. I'm not even going to address all of them because there's so many of them. Uh, So as I've said a number of times, Remember that my work is kind of coming to a conclusion for this week right now. As I speak, your work begins right now. So that as you go home, go back through these texts and consider what it is that God is speaking through, not only this message, but primarily these passages of Scripture. There are many yardsticks by which humans measure success. Some of the things that are most prominent are wealth, power, position, prestige, and you can go on and probably make a list of a bunch of things to add on as well. And those things are all indicators of worldly success. However, measuring your success spiritually and your success as a Christian can be a little bit more difficult at times. Because it may seem that there is very little tangible evidence which you can put your hands on as to show that you are living a successful Christian life. And part of that is because, generally speaking, most of the success that we as believers experience is internal. So what I mean by this is that when we see these small, incremental, external changes in one another, or in our own lives, it is the byproduct of an an enormous amount of internal heart change that's going on. I've heard many people, you know, they, they talk about how God is working in their life, and I ask them to try to express that, and it becomes very difficult. It is very difficult at times to really verbalize the work, because it's work that's being fostered in the heart. And so it can be difficult at times to gauge the success that we have when living in a materialistic world. Thankfully for us, Psalm chapter 1 exists. In this worthy doorkeeper to the Psalms, we find some insights into what makes a believer successful. As the plumb line of God's word moves along your life, see for yourself just how you measure up to God's standard for successful Christian living. As we move through this psalm, allow me to share with you the characteristics of a successful believer. So read with me if you're all read it out loud, but just follow along if you would. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the person who does not sit in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So for those of you, if you're not here often, or maybe you're here for the first time, one of the things I like to do is to put in what I call a sermon in a sentence, Uh, And that is my summary statement for this message, so that when you walk away today, you know, again, you're not going to remember all my stories or all my references, I acknowledge that, but this is something hopefully you can take away to share with those who maybe ask you what you learned about on Sunday. So, my sermon in a sentence this week is this, there are two paths you can take in this life. The wide road of evil that ultimately leads to destruction or the narrow path of spirit-filled living that leads to life. And so today, as I've already said, we're going to look at what it looks like 
to live your life as a successful believer, to live that narrow path of spirit-filled living. So the first aspect that we're going to bring to light here is this idea of that there's a path to being a successful believer. So the first thing that a successful believes with, with regard to the path of being successful is that they, believe, that they understand that they are separated in their walk of life. Now many people, even many professing believers, are sucked into the lies of our culture and even to the life of the culture. But the successful believer understands that we are not called to, be, to conform to the patterns of this world. Romans 12, 1 and 2, my, two of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, they remind us that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we are not to be conformed to the patterns of this world. In Corinthians chapter 3, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 3, Paul wrote, Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul here is so focused on what God has laid before him, that promise. And he isn't affected by what's happening left and right. He isn't allowing those things that people are buying into in the culture to affect his life. He's straining towards the prize that he wants. And so a helpful reminder is that just when you see people around you, even some who may profess to be believers, when they do things contrary to the word, it doesn't make it right or pleasing. Just because the vast majority, or maybe an increasing minority even, tend to be flowing in one direction, it doesn't mean that that's the path that we ought to go. So what else is involved in this path of righteousness? The second thing here is that the righteous person, the person that's seeking to be a successful believer, doesn't believe like the wicked. Now, have you ever noticed in life how people always want to have their two cents? They have all sorts of advice and counsel for you when you come to them. Think about Job's friends. They have all sorts of advice. But we need to remember that their advice for us doesn't always have our best interest in mind. So, as a successful believer, we've got to be careful about whose counsel we listen to and who's, what, what they're inviting us potentially into. We are not tuned into the frequency of those who live in the world and who are uh, who desire the things of the world. We are tuned to a higher frequency. So not only are we to be separated in our beliefs, but and not only are we to believe differently, we also behave differently than the wicked. Now we all have baggage in our past. Satan wants to crush each one of us here with that weight. Psalm 103, verse 1, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Have you ever thought about the fact that there are no east or west poles? You know, if he had said he had cast as far as the north is from the south, you could eventually arrive there. But he doesn't. He says east and west. So as far east as you want to go, you can even go eastern or western. And so it tells you it never ends. And so because God, through our repentance, God has cast our sins away, you are freed to live without the restraint of the things from your past. Someone has said often to me, let the things that are in the past stay in the past. 
If they're still lingering around there, then you may have to ask yourself if you've repented from them, and do you trust God's promise that he's going to forgive them? Because once God's forgiven them, it's don't let Satan allow you to, be, to believe that those things now are uh, inhibiting you from experiencing all that God has for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Again, another powerful piece of scripture. So he said, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. The old man has been put away forever. When Christ comes into your life, it is time to say, The old must go. Anything that still resides in me after all of these years of being a new creation needs to go. He doesn't, finally, he doesn't belong with the wicked. Just really quickly, I'm going to hit on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Therefore, come out from among the unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. Now that message is not saying, you know what, just forget about them. It doesn't, it's not saying just completely separate yourself and never minister to them, but it's saying we need to understand that what God desires of us to be holy, to be set apart for God, requires us often to remove ourselves from the patterns of life that so drive us, that drove us in our past life. Another thing that the successful believer fights against are unbiblical currents. And they're strong right now in this country. Now when I was younger, I took a canoe out and I decided that I was going to, in fact, I think it might have been the first time I went out on a canoe, and I was with someone else who had never canoed before. And uh, so we started to, to we were going to go down a river, and uh, that's what we thought, or up a river, I guess, maybe would be the correct term with the current, but we were going against the current. And at first, we both worked really hard, and we were able to see small incremental growth. And we were encouraged by this. But as we progressed, we became more weary, more tired, and just by nature, our arms started paddling less and less, and it seemed as though the current was going faster and faster. And before long, we were just happy that we were not going backwards. We were satisfied to be, uh, progress was to stay where we were. But then eventually, we started to realize that we were not really going forward, and so we became distraught, thinking we will never get to where we are intended to be. And so, because we didn't see any hope, we just quit paddling. And before long, we were drifted back farther from the destination than when we'd even started. Because of sin in our lives, we naturally tend to drift away from God. Spiritual growth, if it's going to happen in our lives, it requires constant prayer and intentionality, being in the Word on a regular basis, discerning what God's will is. I hear spoken quite frequently that we want to follow the will of the, of the Lord. We do. And that requires constant discernment especially in the day and age that we live in. Because you're not going to normally just walk out your door and get it straight right to you, what God desires. Finally, for the success of the believer in terms of their path, it, it means realizing that there's a vast difference between where you were before you were saved and who you are now to be as a result of being saved. I won't go through the whole summary of this, but one of the ways that I've seen the gospel presented visually is with a chasm in between. Two, you're on two mountains, you're over here and here's God, and there's no way to get across of your own accord. It requires the cross. 
It's as though we are a, to be a chasm, chasm apart from where our life once was. Not because of anything we can do, but because of what he already has done for us. So we recognize that there's a path. There are some things that we can do in, the, in our daily walk in operating differently than the world. Secondly, another thing that is influenced by all of this is what, we, what I'm calling the pleasure of the successful believer. So what is it? You know, in, in 2021, where you have so many things at your disposal, there are so many things that are trying to catch your eye and catch your focus. And because there's so many things, it's hard for any of us to have focus on anything because we're so distracted. But what is it? that captures your affection and delight. Because I'm going to say the first thing for a successful believer is that it's the Word of God that should capture our affection and our delight. It's the very thing that we are to take pleasure in. That the Word of God isn't just some book of fables or myths or legends. To those of us who are children of God, it is the very word of truth. It is God-breathed. It is infallible, inerrant. It has no mistakes. It is everything that God intended it to be. And it's perfect. The successful believer not only will consume this information, but he will love it and he will live it. We'll find in the pages of the text that we read, the need to grow and prosper for Jesus. And so now is when you get inundated with all these scriptures. So hang with me, because I'm going to fly through these fairly quickly. But there are so many reminders, and I couldn't help but feel compelled to dig into this as part of today's message. Because ultimately, there's one thing primarily that characterizes the what I'm calling the successful believer, and it's devotion to the Word. So I'm going to hit you with a bunch of things all scriptural, that devote to what the Word of God is to be in our lives. So first, God's Word is food. Forgive me, I'm not going to reference, you've got those references all in there, I'm not going to mention every reference as I go through it. I think you can look at those later on. But there are phases to this. First, we've got milk. The, the Word of God provides milk for the baby. In 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, it talks about that piece. It gives the baby Christian everything he needs to grow up strong and healthy. Now, we are not that far removed from the baby status in our lives. If you don't prepare it just right, or serve it the correct way, it's going to backfire. It doesn't, you know, they can't do it themselves. I remember one night really resonates with me, and it was with Luke. It was the middle of the night, and we're both exhausted. And so, you know, we're, you'd think after three kids you'd be really organized. But we had a bunch of bottles in the, in the kitchen and a bunch of lids. So in the dark, you know, not trying to make it too light, I grab a bottle, I grab a lid, put the lid on, and hand it to Emily, and she starts to feed Luke. And she says, milk's just squirting everywhere. You know, and I'm tired, and just feed him the bottle, you know. Well, so we look at it and realize that it was a size three lid. And so if you're not familiar, if it's been the number of years, the holes are bigger. There's more holes. And all of a sudden, he wasn't prepared for that. He's on a, a level one with smaller holes, less holes. And so even that little tiny bit, he couldn't handle. And so it was spilling everywhere. So even though there's a little difference, you know, we, we've got to acknowledge that, you know, you know, with, with what stage we're at, where we are at, what we need, what, where God's word resonates. Just as Paul said multiple times, he said, you guys over here, I've been working with you for a long time. I've been teaching you this. You should be eating meat by now, but you're not. You're still sitting there guzzling milk because that's, that's satisfying to you. Now, I imagine trying to feed my kids just milk they get pretty upset at me now because they are past that physical stage. And the same thing, in a sense, should apply to us spiritually. And I mean, not that we get mad, but it's like, you know what? I've heard this. I know this already. So what is it? what are the implications now? Where is the meat, which is next? We all need spiritual meat for growing. That's found in Hebrews chapter 5. 
And I think I've maybe shared this before in another sermon, but I felt like it really resonated again. Imagine if you went to an adult person's home and you saw them drinking out of a baby bottle. Okay, yeah, I think I shared this one time before, but the picture is powerful. You would sense there's something not quite right. The same should be true when we find someone who's maybe been in the church uh, for 20, 30, 40 years. And they're still drinking milk. Meat provides us strength. And we need spiritual meat to make us strong in the Lord. So what is this spiritual meat? What is that actually referring to here? I believe it's referring to the fact that we need to practically and effectively align our lives with what we have learned. It isn't enough to just take it in and do nothing with it. It is now the outpouring. It is how do we now align the decisions we make. And that can be difficult in certain areas. Some areas it's real easy. Say, well, I believe this, therefore this is a natural conclusion. But other areas are more difficult. The, the Word of God is also bread for everyone. John chapter 6. We know that bread is a staple food of the world. No matter where you go, people need the bread of life. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And finally, in the area of food, it's also honey for those in need. Now, I haven't had honey in a long time, but I still have a, you know, I give it to my kids almost every morning, and I still kind of have a hint of the flavor still from the years ago where I ate it more. But it's, it's, uh, it gives great flavor, and it's just a, a sweet taste. You can have something really, you have a dry piece of bread, and you throw a little bit of honey on it, and it just, it can help, at least helps me kind of put it down. And so the honey of the spiritual world is encouragement. Nothing has the power to encourage as the Word of God does. So try something on for me you know, for the next couple of weeks, if you would. And it might require you to carry your Bible with you or your phone with you. But when you stop to try to encourage someone that you see needing encouragement, see if you can encourage them with actual scripture. Go back to God's word and, and, and you know, I, one of the most fruitful conversations I've had since we were out here was back on Memorial Day weekend last year and we were over at Lake and Rhonda's and I was talking with um, one of Jeremy's friends. And what was encouraging to me in this was constant, not just encouragement, but dialogue, and it was scripture, not just random scripture thrown out there, but tethered all together into the fruitful, and it just brought a, a seasoning that was something different. It was not something that you experience every day. So not only is God's word food, it's also light. Psalm chapter 119, it says, God's word shines a light on our sin. God's word is truth. Remember this. Regardless of what you think, regardless of what the world will tell you, you are not the arbiter of truth. God's word is. God is. God's word is a mirror. James chapter 1, it helps to reflect us on who we really are. That's one of the, the great things about scripture is we can... We can be really good about lying to ourselves. And then you dig into, the, into a passage like James chapter 1 and you're like, you know what? Maybe I don't know myself as I really am. Maybe I've been lying to myself. Or you read, you read about encouragement and you realize, you know what? I've been, I've been living in a state of discouragement and depression. And I need to find someone in my life who I can journey through this faith together. Someone who is maybe a meat eater. Sorry, Emily. Me eating. Sorry, that was a bad joke. But, um, so, but find someone that eats spiritual meat and ask them to come alongside you and encourage you and walk with you and challenge you. God's word is water. It cleanses us. It quenches us. 
and it refreshes us. God's word is a seed. 1 Peter chapter 1, we must plant it in people's minds and allow it to grow. Remember all the way back to last February when I was here. Some of you weren't in the room at the time, but what I said was, we need to do our part. Let God do his part. We know he's going to do his part. Let those whom we are speaking to and witnessing to do their part, and our part is plant the seed. Don't remove yourself necessarily if the seed doesn't take root right away. We can be real quick to, oh, I tried to plant a seed and that didn't work. So then we leave the person and maybe never, we think, well, that just maybe wasn't God's plan. Well, maybe that plan is down the road a ways. Maybe it'd be easier to just kind of plant the seed and then kind of flee because, you know, I really don't want to deal with the mess that is in this individual's life. Stick around. Be, don't, don't. Don't condone, don't condone the sin, don't participate in the sin, but stick around. Too often as believers we run away because we think, man, I don't want to get, I don't want to be connected in any way to this. And the reality is that over time, when that seed takes root, if you're if you're present in their lives, you're there to help them see the fulfillment. It's kind of like Bonnie said last week in a much smaller scale. She said, as a teacher, what do teachers, and I, I used to be a teacher, what do we love to see? We love it when kids' eyes go like this. They realize something. So don't you all want to be around when someone spiritually does that? They wake up and they realize it. There's no greater feeling than that. When it's like, ah, I get it now. God's word is a sword. Again, I go back to, we need to fight with his word not just our own thoughts. If you don't have something to add to a conversation that's not biblically supported, I would suggest that you maybe hold your tongue for the time being. That can be difficult because we want to we want to input things on every you know we want to we want to interject our thoughts on every topic under the sun. And I would, I would say that that can be more dangerous than anything, especially when you get into some of these more difficult conversations. And I'll name them today. I mean, one of them right off the bat that I hear over and over again is politics. When you're going to interject into politics, if you've got nothing to say that doesn't support, isn't supported by Scripture, leave it unsaid. Do some study. Dig into it. If you don't have good biblical support for why you believe what you believe, then get back in the Word and figure out why you believe it. There's good biblical evidence probably for a lot of what you have come to believe and what you've been taught. But I have learned that there were some things I was taught by well-intentioned, believing parents that I've learned differently as I've, as I've dug through the Word a little bit more. Things that have, over time, man-centered teaching gets entangled in it. So dig into the Word. God's word is like a hammer. It can build us up, but it can also, equally importantly, it can tear us down. And I don't mean that in a tear us down in a negative way. It can, you've maybe heard it said, we need to, in the, it's in the military concept, you need to tear the person down. You need to tear the negative things, the negative attributes down. Hopefully I'm making that clear. I'm not saying tear them down verbally or make them feel less of a person, but it's, we need to remove all of those old negative Traits that old man that lives in us need to die. And then lastly, in this section, God's word is a fire. And it refines us and purifies us. When God's, when, when you are feeling the fires of life, the trials, the tests, remember they are for a purpose. They are to refine you. They are to purify you. Ultimately, we are to be in love with the Bible. We know the pages. And when we know them, it can satisfy what the soul requires. The Word of God meets every need that man has. I'm sure you've all heard this saying, you know, I've got a, a God-sized hole in my heart. Or something of that nature. You know, that, that only thing that can fill everything in your life that is lacking is God. So do you love God's word as you should? 
I mean, not only has the Word of God hopefully a, a captured your affection and your attention, it's also captured your full attention. Not only does the successful believer look in the Bible and love the Bible, but he lives it out daily. It's internalized to the point where it becomes the singular standard, not only for your faith, but for practice. Every thought, every move, every decision that you make should be against the backdrop of biblical truth. What does the Bible have to say? You know, if someone says, well, what do you think about this? Well, my first thought should be, what does the Bible say about this? That's my standard basis to start. The psalmist declares that the successful believer spends his days and nights in pursuit of the Bible. Does the truth of Scripture fill your thoughts? Are you consumed and mesmerized by the idea of meditating on the Word as we are called to do? Because in reality, the Bible is never better than when you actually live it out. You can't just read it. You can't just leave it on a shelf. You know, can't just skim through the pages and say, well, I read through it. Check that off the list. But you've got to start there. Finally, the prosperity of the successful believer. Now, the promises in verse 3 in the text this morning, from way back at the beginning, are conditional. When we live lives set apart for God, and we feed our souls with God's word, then we can expect these things to happen. So first, note a few things about that passage. You may have to flip back. I don't have Psalm 1 put back up there on the screen. But notice the position in verse 3 that the believer takes. By the river. This person is always near life-giving resources. Now this part was particularly impactful, and actually really impactful to us right now as we were praying for rain this morning, that in Israel they were living in very arid conditions. The tree that was planted by the river was always green. It was lush. It was lovely. The believer who lives near or next to God will always be green and lush, will never be dry and wilted. We will be vibrant and productive. We'll know, the, we'll know the joy of drawing from Christ daily. Those that are farther from the river will not daily experience this. And yeah, they will look spiritually wilted. The droughts of life and the dry season never seem to affect the believer that's living grounded in his position next to the river because we are connected to the true source of life. I mean, maybe you've witnessed that in people that you see someone, like, man, they just aren't phased by anything. Even the worst conditions, and it's, how do they hold it together? Well, it's, they put their trust in Christ. Next is prominence. Now consider the tallest tree in a forest of trees. The life of, the tr of the life of a successful believer stands heads above all those around him. It's clear to see where their belief is drawn from, that they depend truly upon Jesus. His permanence, that this tree is planted. Now, unlike some trees, they will wilt and die out when their season is up. But this tree that we've planted as, as a successful believer will not die. It's sunk its roots so deep, and it has this hidden source of life. This thing that non-believers can't quite put their finger on. How is it that you find life in the midst of what you see? It doesn't come by chance. It comes through a life of private prayer and Bible study. You aren't going to just wake up tomorrow if you are not sunk in with your roots. If you aren't going to just wake up tomorrow and you find your roots are fully developed. That's the internal part. A lot of this happens behind the scenes. You don't just wake up tomorrow a transformed person. The word planted in the text is actually means transplanted. 
Now a tree, I've never, we haven't had this in our experience, we've never seen a tree or a plant transplant itself. It can't. And so neither can we transplant ourselves into the kingdom of heaven. It is wholly the work of God's grace. And he always, when we're planted, he, he always plants us in good soil. But after we are planted, it's our responsibility to draw from the resources which God provides. His productivity, next, is that we are not here to just fill space. We are here to bring fruit. Now we all have, are very familiar with the verse in John chapter 15 that we know a tree by its fruit and what it bears. The successful believer is a blessing to all those around him or her because their fruit is plentiful. Think about an apple tree in a cow pasture. Man, cows, birds, and insects all benefit from the fruit of this old tree. We are called to be feeding others spiritually. In fact, right now, as we speak or as you listen, you may not even know everyone who is being fed off of your life. You may think it's just another decision that you make, or it's just the decision that you make is only going to uh, is only going to affect you. But as a believer, you have those around you who are affected by the choices that you make. His predictability. As a successful believer, like the tree, we are to be reliable. Now there are seasons of bearing for trees for fruit. There are also times for rest and for growth. So one bit of encouragement here is don't fret away the day over the worry about the fruit themselves being produced. God is in the business of producing the fruit. If we're being reliable, predictable, if we are doing our part, if we are depending upon the word, God will produce the fruit when the season is right. Next is perpetuity. It says, the leaf shall not fade. The, sex, the successful believer is like an evergreen. Now, growing up, we had a couple of evergreen trees in our front yard. It's interesting because an evergreen is always green. All the other trees start to die off when winter comes. And yet, here we have the evergreen standing just the same as before. They're unaffected by the weather, by the cold. They are always the same. Our lives should look just like that in terms of consistency. We are called to be stable. How often does Paul talk about that? We need to be stable and faithful and dependable. The curveballs that life throws at us are, to, are unable to knock us off course. His prosperity, whatever he does, he shall prosper. In other words, God will bless the successful believer. His personal life, his family life, his business life, his church life, his spiritual life will be blessed. Now, don't lose your train of thought. Or, you know, listen to this part in particular because this is where people are going to say, oh, that's prosperity gospel right there. Do this and get this. No, that's not what I'm saying. Scripture does not promise that you will guarantee do A, B, and C and get material possessions. There will be stormy seas. You have all experienced it. But the successful believer will be able to sail through them more easily because they know that Jesus fights and Jesus is there for them. That ultimately there is a greater calling. And Jesus will calm the storms again. So in conclusion, I ask this question. Do you possess the characteristics that, was, that were described here in Psalm 1 for the successful believer. Because if so, the very first word says that you are blessed. And this means, oh, to be very, very happy. I hope that you have seen this amongst yourselves and that you are encouraged about your walk with Jesus. You see that it is possible to be successful for Christ 
and to acknowledge it and to know it without being self-righteous. However, if you find yourself lacking, and yes, by the way, just to clear, to mention, we all lack in some area. I'm not saying that you will fully arrive, because we won't, this side of eternity. But if you find yourself saying, you know, I just really am not seeing these experiences in my life, then just understand that Jesus stands just as ready today as he did from the beginning of time, and even from before time. He's willing and ready and able to make things right again in your lives. And so if that's you this morning, let's talk about what those steps might be to help you to make your lives fruitful in the way that God intended them to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Psalm chapter 1 and, and giving us not only in this psalm, but throughout the, the scriptures, Lord, a, a roadmap to this life. Lord, not a roadmap that will make our lives perfect while we are on earth, but a roadmap for living a, a holy life, Lord, and that's what you've called us to. You've called us to love because you have first loved us, and you've called us to, to, to be at peace with one another and to reconcile just as you have reconciled us to yourselves. Lord, I pray that as we look at some of the things the characteristics of what it looks like to live a life of fruitfulness. Lord, that we, uh, that we do our part to, to station ourselves near the source of life, near you, or near your word. Lord, I pray that where we have found your word to be dry or uh, boring, whatever term we want to use, Lord, that you would re-energize re, uh, us and re-encourage us and show us the, the true value of your word, Lord. We know that your spirit lives in us, and it is through the spirit with which you speak. So, Lord, help us to listen to the spirit. Lord, also help us to, uh, to be reminded of the impact that our lives as believers have on those who are around us. Lord, let us hold fast to the responsibilities and truths that you have given us, this promise of joy in this life and the, the truth that, that uh, we want to strain forward for just like Paul expressed. Lord, help us to keep our eyes so fixated on, on your will and your works that nothing else uh, is even a, a glimpse of, uh, of, of desire for us to even look at. Lord, help us to focus our lives on living for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing benediction and we'll have one last song. May the Lord bless you and keep you and the Lord make your face shine upon you and be gracious to you and the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And remember church, this week just like every other, Let's go out into the, into the uh, mission field because you are sent.